Welcome to this inaugural lecture, and it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Jitt. Um, so Mark uh, did his undergraduate degree at University College London in mathematics and went straight on to do a PhD in mathematics also at University College. I think he then worked for a couple of years in the Clinical Operational Research Unit at UCL, and then moving to Public Health England, or then Health Protection Agency, as a health economist and mathematical modeler. He then did a master's in public health, I think part-time, uh, Mark, I think, uh, so obviously felt he needed some more public health training. And then also had a year at the University of Birmingham as a senior lecturer in mathematical modeling before returning to Public Health England. He joined the school in 2012 as a shared position between Public Health England and ourselves and took up the position of senior lecturer in vaccine epidemiology. Uh, since then, he's progressed both here and in Public Health England, um, maintaining this joint position and, in addition, between 2017 and 2020, taking on another part-time appointment as visiting professor in the University of Hong Kong School of Public Health. So a very interesting career bridging now three different uh, places that he works in. So uh, in addition to, to those appointments within the school, he's functioned as the lead of the modelling and economic evaluation of vaccines group and recently has taken on as co-leader of the modelling group within the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology. He's also been a management group member of the Vaccine Centre. As you would expect from a professor, he has an extensive uh, grants track record as principal investigator and co-investigator and theme leader. His most recent achievement as PI is to have won the NIHR Global Health Research Group on Evidence to Policy Pathway to Immunisation in China. And I think it was last week you had a big visitation from, from the people involved in, in the research in China. He also provides quite a lot of technical support to Gavi and WHO on modelling and economic evaluation of vaccines. He's also part of large consortia, for example, the Vaccine Impact Modelling Consortium, funded by the Melinda Melinda Gates Foundation, and the NIHR Health Protection Research Unit in Immunisation, focusing here on the school. But in addition, he has a huge range of other engagement in grants, contributing cost-effectiveness and modelling skills in a variety of areas relating to a very large number of, of different vaccines. He has 154 journal articles, 27 as first author, 32 as senior author. He's on a variety of expert committees and working groups. He's on the Economic Guidelines Task Group of the National Advisory Committee on Immunisation in Canada, on various WHO working groups, and particularly on the WHO Strategic Group of Experts on Immunisation called SAGE, their Immunisation and Vaccines Implementation Research Advisory Group, and measles and rubella working group. He's engaged significantly in our teaching programme and most notably uh, engaging in short courses with some of our partners, being joint coordinator of the Croucher Summer Course on Vaccinology for Public Health and Clinical Practice in the 21st Century, which is a joint venture between the school and the University of Hong Kong, and similarly joint coordinator of a short course on vaccinology uh, between ourselves and the National University of Singapore. So Mark's CV really demonstrates the range of achievements across research, education and policy engagement that I think reflects some of the best of what our professors do at the school. So Mark describes his research interests as investigating the epidemiological and economic impact of vaccines and other disease control interventions to support evidence-based public health decision-making, much of this work uses transmission dynamic models to capture ecological effects of interventions beyond the individual. And he says he's particularly interested in the use of modelling to inform the interface between technical questions about the impact of vaccines and normative questions about what health and economic goals we should pursue. So perhaps that's a bit of a background to this interesting question of the moral mathematics of valuing vaccines. So Mark, you give your inaugural lecture, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, making sure this is ah, this this is my first slide. Thanks. Um, well, nice to hear about myself being described, and thank you everyone for coming. I think it's uh, it's it's an honor to be here. I'm really really pleased to be able to give this lecture. In fact, it's such an honor that this is the first time in my life I'm giving an inaugural lecture, which you probably know already. Um, and because it's the first time when I was asked to do this, the first thing I did really was to actually try to find out what I'm supposed to do for inaugural lecture. So I think I have been for one or two, but I started watching, actually the London School has a whole video collection of, um, well, previous people who have given inaugural lectures and it's all in an archive. So I started to watch some of them and actually um, a lot of them are really good. I mean, they're, they're, there's, there's, um, it's, quite a, it's quite a nice exercise actually to go through them and start watching some of the like um, interesting highlights from these lectures and um, seeing what they said. So um, I think I learned quite a bit. It's almost like, it's, it's sort of like I'm um, watching a sort of TED talk collection. You have a whole collection of really interesting people um, really being passionate about um, the subject that they've been exploring for a long time and um, helping you to understand a bit about where they come from and also what, uh, about their work. So having watched that, I think I more or less decided that I might do some th things a little bit differently and my talk might be a bit less autobiographical than a lot of them. I mean, people who know me know that I'm really bad at self-disclosure anyway, right? So I think um, probably John will be better at describing me later in, when he talks. Um, it's, I'm also not really going to give you a tour of everything I've ever done in my career, but what I'd like to do really is to speak about um, one particular topic which I think has um, really undergirded uh, much of the work that um, I've done together with colleagues over the past 10 or 15 years, but has never really been in the foreground explicitly talked about in most of it. And that's actually what are the really what are the values that undergird a lot of the work that we do around modeling and economic evaluations of vaccines and health interventions in general. And to do that, I'm going to actually, well, maybe because I'm not really going to tell the whole story about my life, I'll tell three stories about vaccines and then also interact with um, what I've been doing and what other people have been doing. So I'm going to tell three stories about vaccines, which hopefully bring out some of these um, concepts and principles um, to light. And along the way, on this journey that um, I'll take on these three stories, I also hope to, well, really, um, pay tr uh, really pay tribute to some of the work, not only that I've done, but also that other people, colleagues I've really had the pleasure of interacting with have done so along the way. So talk about what I've done, what other people have done, and what we've been able to do together in these areas. So three stories. The first story, the first story I'm going to talk about is really, um, well, um, the, 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 um, to explain the title of the talk a bit. So the term moral mathematics is actually not completely original from me. Moral mathematics is a term that was originally used by um, Derek Parfit, a moral philosopher. Who in a, he, well, he's, I think he's only written two books in his life, and the most famous is the first one he wrote, um, Reasons and Persons. And one chapter on it was really um, a chapter entitled Five Mistakes in Moral Mathematics. Now, Reasons and Persons is really a book that puts forward this. Uh, one of the central theses of this book is that actions have some inherent goodness or badness in their own right. Qu apart from the outcomes that, you can, <laughs> uh, that these actions produce, there is something right or wrong, morally right or wrong, uh, that you can say about certain actions. And so if you think about it, that is really a critique of some aspects of, um, well, it's really a critique of act utilitarianism, which is what undergirds some aspects of economic evaluation, which is what I spend all, most of my career doing, although not all um, versions of, um, well, um, economic evaluation. Depends exactly how it's used and how it's um, presented. But the interesting thing that I'm going to talk about from, well, reasons and persons, the, the reason I know all this is not because I'm a moral philosopher, but because um, I ha had the benefit of reading um, part of Derek Parfit's work 
on route of exploring something called discounting. So discounting is an economic and accounting term. And I usually introduce it in lectures with something like this. So discounting. Imagine um, if, you, if you've not heard of discounting before. Imagine that you live in a world without inflation, right? So there's no inflation. If you can buy, well, if you can buy a, something today, you can buy it for exactly the same price in 10 years' time. The, val the cost of things do not go up in time, right? So that's, um, that's, that's the world without inflation. Now in this world, in the world without inflation, uh, imagine that today I owe you a thousand pounds, right? En route to this inaugural lecture, I just discovered that I need to buy a grand new suit and it costs a thousand pounds. This doesn't really cost a thousand pounds, but Im imagine. And, I was, and you came all the way to this lecture from a long way away, and then you said, well, we'll meet in 10 years' time. So you have two options. I can pay you back at the end of this lecture, or when we meet again in 10 years' time, I can pay you back the same thousand pounds. And remember, there's no inflation. Just as a poll, um, who would rather I paid you back in 10 years' time? And who would you rather I paid you back today? Okay, that's the question that um, I always get the same response to. And, and that's true. Even if there's no inflation, we'd prefer to have, well, money now rather than later. We'd prefer to have generally um, good things that we can store up now rather than later. And usually, although not all the time, um, we prefer to have bad things in the future rather than now, right? So economists call this change of the value of money, or actually um, the value of things with value over time, discounting. Basically what it's saying is that even without inflation, if something is worth a certain amount now, actually if you had, if you received it in the future, the value of that um, receiving that, well, that, 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 that money in the future would be worth less to you right now than if you got it straight away. Right? And the way to cal work that out mathematically is you can basically ha um, have some sort of discount rate, which is a certain percentage which says, well, over time or each year, the value of something that you get, the present value of something that you get in the future is reduced by a certain percentage. And so if you were to have a lot of money in a hundred years time, then actually the value of it today would be worth a lot less than if you ha were to have a lot of money today. Okay, now discounting, it's an accounting and economic concept, and it's used in when we evaluate, well, when, when we look at the economic va value of lots of things, including vaccines, and discounting is actually a big deal for vaccines. Let me give you an example. This is, um, we'll talk a bit more about this work, but this is some work that I did together with my colleague Yun Choi at Public Health England and John Edmonds um, when he was the head of the modeling and economics unit there. So this is looking at basically the cost effectiveness of an HPV vaccine. So this is a great example of how actually vaccines can bring you benefits that are a long way in the future. So HPV is a virus that, well, the peak age of infection with HPV in the UK is sort of roughly between, in, in the sort of early, early 20s is when the um, highest prevalence in the UK population for HPV is. HPV is an uh, infection that causes cervical and other cancers. And most of these cancers, the peak age for um, having cervical cancer is sort of like in the mid 30s. So there is a delay of about 10 to 20 years between the point of infection and the time when people get cancer from HPV. For, I mean, in other countries, the delay is even longer because of um, it's shorter in the UK because of screening, because of some reasons that I won't try to go into now. But basically, what, what the, 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 the point is, you get vaccinated today. So if someone gets vaccinated today, nothing will happen. No, they, their life will not change in any way other than a sort of, other than a sort of, um, well, short um, bit of pain in their arm. However, their life might change in 10 or 20 years time when they are a perfectly healthy human being rather than in hospital with cancer, right? So you, have, you pay for the cost of the vaccination now. I mean, well, the government pays for the cost of the vaccination now and the benefits occur maybe 10 or 20 years in the future. And so if you were to look at to see what happens, well, here we have the costs 
for instance, of an HPV vaccination program, for instance, in the UK, every year we pay a certain amount of money to vaccinate people with cervical cancer in the UK. The benefits are this dotted black line and then no benefits for actually years and years until you start not seeing cervical cancer cases because 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you vaccinated people against cervical cancer. And so when you discount this, when you say how much is, are those costs or how much are those health benefits worth to you now, according to the standard rules of discounting, you would say, well, these costs that you pay today to vaccinate people are still um, worth a lot because you're paying them today. The costs in the future are worth less, so these reduce in value. However, the effect of discounting on the health benefits is a lot greater because most of the health benefits are in the future. There are almost no benefits to vaccination today because people take a long time to get cancer. But in 20 or 30 years time, that's when you start to see the health benefits. And by discounting rules, these are worth less. Okay, so this is discounting is a big deal for vaccines. And so there's plenty of debate in the world of vaccines over how we should discount, whether we should discount, what rate we should use, and whether we should discount costs and um, cancer, well, health, such, such as cancers prevented at the same rate. So actually, Derek Parfit actually interacted with this. So Derek himself is not a fan of discounting. And one argument that was presented for discounting is really what he called the argument from excessive sacrifice. What's the argument from excessive sacrifice? Actually, the best example of this, which is not actually an example he used, but is an example from the world of vaccines, is eradication. So for instance, today, we have a lot of benefit from smallpox vaccination. No Hawaii gets <laughs> vaccinated against smallpox today. No, no government spends any money um, well, there might be some stockpiles of smallpox vaccine, and I suppose CDC pays a bit of um, electricity for wanting to keep the sort of um, virus in some vault deep in their cellars or something. But basically, nobody pays much for smallpox vaccination. But there are people today who are alive and in good health who wouldn't be if we didn't have a smallpox vaccine, well, years ago when it was eradicated, right? So if we were to eradicate something, the benefits of that eradication are uh, enjoyed by generations and generations until, in principle, forever, right? Whereas the costs are borne by a certain generation that introduces the vaccination program. Now, if you think about it, if you don't discount, then actually, the, the, from this argument from excessive sacrifice, you'd be saying that actually, because the stream of benefits from eradicating a disease are sort of forever, in principle, this generation should be willing to pay an infinite amount in order to benefit future generations. And you could say that's an excessive sacrifice. Why should this generation be willing really to drive themselves to poverty so that a million generations in the future can enjoy the benefits of this vaccination? Now, Derek Parfit, actually, I think his, um, his argument against this argument from excessive sacrifice is correct, even though I might not completely agree with his point that we shouldn't discount it at all. His argument was that actually this is not an argument about discounting. This is not saying that the value of something decreases the further in the future you get. This is really an argument about equity. It's the argument that no one generation should be expected to sacrifice too much. And so if it's an argument about equity, then why don't we treat it as an equity argument and have a rule that says no one generation should pay too much for, towards something that benefits other generations, rather than treating it as a discounting problem. Now, I'm not going to go into that a bit too much, but actually, around the same time I was sort of reading up on Derek Parfit, I was interacting with a, a really smart health economist, James O'Mayoni at Trinity College Dublin, who actually pointed out some interesting, something interesting that actually, well, if anyone had noticed before, they hadn't really made it explicit, which is when we, when we model vaccines, when we look at the, try to model the impact of vaccines or infectious disease interventions, we often use what's called a transmission dynamic model. This is a model that captures not just the direct effect of vaccinating someone, but also the indirect effect on preventing the spread of that infection across populations. And because there are these indirect effects, be, the, um, someone who is vaccinated doesn't transmit to someone else, and so other people also benefit. These effects can cross generations, can cross cohorts. It, they don't only affect the, 
cohort we're following who gets the intervention, but they might affect other cohorts of individuals too. So these dynamic models are usually almost always multiple cohort models. Now he pointed out when you have a multiple cohort model like a dynamic model, if you discount health and co um, consumption or costs at, at different rates, so let's say we wanted to discount the cost of the vaccine at a different rate from the rate at which we discount the cancers. If we were to do that, then the number of cohorts we follow will actually alter the effect of discounting. This is an unintended effect, which, is, uh, which I won't go into the mathematical details, but it's also saying that if you had a model with multiple cohorts, like a dynamic model and a static model with only one cohort, then the results are basically non-comparable. You can't say a dynamic model gives you the answer that a static model gives you, except it gives you the indirect effects as well. Because you have multiple cohorts, if you use this um, differential discounting, these are are basically not comparable, which is quite an important thing. It says that if, you're, if you were to do that, you couldn't, say, look at the cost effectiveness of a vaccine and compare it to, say, the cost effectiveness of a cancer drug where you only follow one cohort in order to capture its value. And, well, the whole principle of economic evaluation is these evaluations are comparable. So you should be able to say, I can decide whether I want to spend my money on a cancer drug or a vaccine. Well, James pointed out, if you're using differential discounting, this doesn't work. So actually, it's interacting with these various people that um, a couple of years ago, together with Walter Mibe, who was a student here at the school at that time, actually wrote a sort of critical review on how we should discount when it comes to vaccines. And one interesting um, way to address actually both these issues that James brought up as well as the excessive sacrifice issue is actually to do something called two-stage discounting, which was first suggested by Lipscomb, I think more than two decades ago, but actually make a variant of this two-stage discounting where you use a different discounting rate for when you're discounting within a cohort, so as someone grows older, you discount what would happen in, to their life in the future at a certain rate. And then between cohorts, you use a different discounting rate, which might even be zero if you have an explicit rule to say, well, maybe an equity rule saying that we, we don't want one cohort or one generation to have an excessive cost or an excessive benefit at the expense of other generations. Okay, I won't go into the maths of this. Uh, this is story one, simply to point, mainly to point out one important aspect, which is to say to reach a conclusion like that, we actually need to bring a few disciplines together. Really, what we need to do is, first of all, think about logical correctness. As James pointed out, there are certain mathematical um, computations you do on to, to a mathematical model, which will give you certain results. And if you're not aware of that, you're going to get an answer that you're not expecting. So the first thing is logical correctness, mathematics. A second thing we need to think about is value. Why do we bother about these mathematical computations at all? It's because we value things. We value health, but we value also not spending our money. And so we have to make these decisions about how much value do we get from certain things. So that's the realm of economics, asking, well, why should we prioritize one thing over another? But third of all, there's also the field, of the questions about justice. Actually, why should we value something at all? And why should we value one person getting one thing compared to another? And, and so these fields are often, well, well, are all, I mean, these fields are all relevant to vaccines, but they're often in their own separate compartments. But actually to answer these questions, like the question I brought up about discounting, we actually need to bring them all together and tackle them at the same time, as, as, as I talked about. So this is a first story about a sort of foray into discounting and encountering Parfit, as well as, well, um, uh, James's work and um, being able to interact with James as well. Okay, for my second story, this might interact a bit more with actually a lot of the work I've been doing. The second story is really a story with two narratives. The second story is a story about the value of vaccines. How much do we value vaccines? Are vaccines a good idea? And really, this, ha this is a story with actually maybe two narratives, two separate narratives, which seem to be contradictory at times, but both narratives have truth in them, and both are really very powerful narratives at the moment. So the first narrative is this. The first narrative is that vaccines are a great global health success story. In fact, vaccines are one of the best things you can do in global health. 
So for instance, here some okay, here's some modeling that was done by a group of modelers that um, did um, that looked at the effect that the Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, has had on lives saved around the world. So Gavi is a partnership that funds vaccines, that buys vaccines in large quantities, and then makes them available at no or low cost to countries, that, the poorest countries in the world. So the, between 50 to about 90 of the poorest countries in the world, depending on which year it is, that can't really afford to buy these vaccines themselves. And so this consortium of modelers basically worked out that in this decade, called the decade of vaccines, the 2010s, all the values funded by Gavi would have probably saved around 30 million lives in this decade. So basically what they're saying is we're coming to the end of the 2010s. If this is correct, more or less it's saying that today there are about 30 million people alive who would be dead if these vaccines were not well um, funded. So that's a great story. 30 million people, that's a lot of people. I mean, it's also good value for money. So this goes back to um, here's here's an example from some early work done by actually by the World Bank who commissioned a report because they wanted to ask the question, actually, what is the best thing for countries to do in terms of buying health investments? And so they looked at a whole bunch of different health investments, worked out how cost effective they are, really how much life, how much health are you buying for every dollar you spend? And they came up with a sort of um, best buy list, you could say. Um, and very close to the top of that list is something they call EPI+. Plus. So the EPI vaccines are the vaccines that WHO at that time recommended every country to have. Basically measles, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, um, polio, um, hepatitis B vaccines. And then the plus refers to vitamin A supplementation for children. This costs, they said, about twelve to seventeen dollars per dali, which is basically saying that you can save a year of someone's life by paying about twelve to seventeen dollars. Even given the fact that that was quite a long time ago, that seems like a really good investment. I mean, in the UK today, admittedly a much richer country than the countries they were thinking of, we're willing to spend about twenty to thirty thousand pounds for a year of someone's to 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 to, to for, for for someone to have an extra year of life in. Perfect health. So this is an incredibly uh, investment that looks incredibly good value, and it is. These are vaccines that save lives. They're great value. But then let's turn it around. And then there's a second narrative which says actually, but then these vaccines are beyond the reach of many. And actually, are they really accessible? Are they really such good um, value in all places? So people talk about, um, well, the storyline of vaccines in the 20th century. I mean, we can see that the number of vaccines that have been developed over the past, um, well, 50 years or so has really accelerated. And that's great. That means there are more options for saving lives of people who are dying of infectious disease. However, maybe you could think of, I mean, people have said the current era is like a second golden age of vaccines because the first golden age was in the 30s to the 60s when there was this bunch of vaccines, the EPI vaccines I talked about. These were cheap vaccines. These were um, vaccines that were against really common infections. Everyone at that time, everyone at, in that era apparently had measles. That was, I think I was... Um, I was born just as the, um, I checked, I was born in Malaysia um, just a few years after measles vaccine became sort of routine in Malaysia. I'm pretty sure I have, I had measles vaccine, although I can't, I, I don't have a vaccine card, so I wasn't one of the people who had measles in my life, but maybe people born just 10 years ago definitely would have. So cheap, effective vaccines against common infections, which could kill people. And they were delivered to infants or to young children. So every country in the world knew, how do we give these vaccines? They're to infants. We have a program to deliver these vaccines to infants. Then starting from the 1970s, a slew of new vaccines were developed. Vaccines against um, infections, um, which, um, which were sometimes less common. So these new vaccines, starting around the 1970s with hepatitis B and Haemophilus influenzae, they were slightly different. Some of them were le against less common infections, like a vaccine against uh, many of the meningo um, men meningococcal vaccines, against really terrible diseases that dis kill people or um, destroy their lives by leaving them with permanent disabilities, but not very common compared to measles, for instance. Some of 
these vaccines are a lot more expensive. Human papillomavirus vaccine I talked about, when it was first introduced in the US, cost about $120 a dose for a free course vaccine, compared to measles, which costs right now about a dollar a dose. Uh, some of them are quite complicated because their efficacy or the, um, may not be, um, might not be extremely high or they might wane. So some of the vaccines we've heard of recently, vaccines against malaria or RSV or dengue, there's now debate about how we should use them, when we should use them, because they are complicated in terms of what if impact they'll have. And often they're tri delivered to non-traditional risk groups. So not just to infants, but to groups that actually countries find it hard to deliver them to, maybe adolescents or adults. So the big problem, the, 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 the big problem behind this is really, these might still be good vaccines, but the cost of both buying and delivering them has increased a lot compared to the value proposition. And actually, um, MSF, Medicine Sans Frontiers, uh, actually um, did some sort of analysis, actually really pointing this out. And this is something that I met um, Kate Elder, who is the uh, vaccine policy advisor for Medicine Sans Frontiers. And she's the person who got me interested, actually, in the whole question about vaccine pricing, for which I um, thank her. But um, this was something that MSF pointed out. In 2001, you could buy every vaccine that WHO recommended for 67 cents a dose. By 2014, the entire course of vaccines that WHO recommended, so not just, not all vaccines in the world, the, only the vaccines that WHO said every country in the world should be using, cost $45 for the entire course, which is really more than the health budget per capita of probably the hundred, I mean, of, of the poorest countries in the world. So really, without external aid, these countries will just not be able to afford these vaccines. So what's the solution? The solution, um, the economists will say the convergence of these two narratives really is economic evaluation, right? So we should be asking ourselves, if we have a limited budget, how do we best spend this budget on a way that buys us the most health? And so the way economic evaluation works is really we're asking ourselves, which of these two worlds would we like to live in? There's a world without the vaccine where we pay a certain amount for, we have a certain health burden because people get sick and we pay a certain amount to treat them. Or we can have a world with the vaccine where we pay something to buy the vaccine and to deliver the vaccine, but then the health burden and the cost of treating the illness decreases. And so we ask ourselves, which is a better world to live in? Let's trade off the extra cost with the health that we're gaining from that. And so, well, let me, so let me start to talk a bit about um, my own work on economic evaluation. So this really started um, sort of more than a decade ago. And one of the first sort of vaccines that um, we, we looked at together with John and other colleagues at Public Health England was HPV vaccine. I said I would come back to this in a moment. So basically in 2016, the HPV vaccine was licensed in, well, in Europe and in the US. And um, so the question is, is this a good vaccine to introduce into the, health, in, in, into the vaccine schedule in the UK? It costs a good deal more than a measles vaccine, for instance, but it also buys a lot of health. As I said, in, today there are probably people who, are not, who do not have cancer, who are not dead, because more than a decade ago, HPV vaccine was introduced. So how does the process work? Um, we really put together a mathematical model, basically a series of, um, well, com 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 computer programs that look at the natural history of, um, of um, human papillomavirus and associated disease, this um, transmission of the infection between people through sexual um, um, partnerships, and then the economic impact of all the disease and um, the, 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 the interventions. Put this all in lots of computers, run it for many nights because these are big complicated programs, and then out comes a certain um, prediction which says if you introduce this vaccine in this year to this group of people, you're going to prevent so many people from getting cancer and that's worth so much at a certain point of time. And um, so you put that together and because in the UK, because vaccine decisions are, which is a great thing, are evidence-based and are based on actually the outcomes of well, um, modeling and economic evaluation to see what the impact of um, introducing a vaccine might be according to these models. 
um, when, when all this work was done, it then led to the conclusion that actually introducing HPV vaccination for girls at that time would be a cost-effective intervention. And very soon later, the HPV um, jab was in people's arms. So that's the good news story. That's a story of how actually here's an expensive vaccine, but it's good value for money when you work it out. And if you sit down and do these calculations, it's a great buy. That's, and so we should be giving this vaccine to people. That's a great news story. But then we go on in this story and then start to ask ourselves, well, then which countries would then introduce the vaccine? And here's a map. It's from 2016, but actually hasn't really changed that much yet. Here's a map of the countries that have introduced the HPV vaccine um, to date. Um, so most of the countries that have the ones in deep blue are the countries that have introduced many other vaccines. So mostly countries in Western Europe, North America, well, the Americas really, um, Latin America as well, and Australasia. So are these the best countries? I mean, definitely this, this is a great vaccine to introduce in these countries. Are the countries that have not introduced a vaccine, is that because this is, vaccine isn't a good idea in the rest of the world? Let's look at the actual burden of cervical cancer. Which are the countries with the highest burden of cervical cancer which can be prevented by this vaccine? These are the countries in the deep orange, brown, whatever you want to call it, red. It's almost the exact inverse of the map I showed before. In other words, the very countries that have not introduced this vaccine are actually the countries with the highest burden. I'll put it a different way you give one person an HPV vaccine in the UK, if you vaccinate a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand people, you might prevent one person from getting cervical cancer, which is great. Let's vaccinate those thousand people and prevent one case of cervical cancer. If you went to Nigeria or India or DRC, you could probably vaccinate about a hundred or 200 people rather than a thousand to prevent a case of cervical cancer. So if we're vaccinating people in the UK, why are we not vaccinating people in these other countries? Well, the answer is, the, the immediate answer, which is not completely true, is the countries can't afford it, which has some truth to it. But the solution to that is, well, the solution to that should be Gavi, right? I've talked about Gavi already, the um, partnership that buys vaccines and makes them available at low prices um, to these um, low-income countries. So how, why hasn't that solved the problem? So Gavi, these countries can actually access vaccines at very, very low prices. Well, one problem is that they still need to deliver these vaccines, which is actually also really expensive in countries which don't have a school health or adolescent health program to deliver the vaccines. Another issue is actually, well, what about the rest of the world? So I said in the US, the HPV vaccine costs about $120 a dose. We probably pay a lot less here in the UK because we buy vaccines as part of a national tender, but still it's probably in the, I don't know what the price is, it's, in, it's confidential, but probably in the tens rather than hundreds. Gavi buys a vaccine for 460 a dose. Another group of countries that band together, the countries in the Americas, um, the, so PAHO buys the vaccine at about 850 a dose. What about the rest of the world? How, what, at what price does the rest of the world um, buy this vaccine at? Actually, nobody really knows but actually WHO and other people have done quite a bit of work trying to get as much information as they can, usually anonymously, about how much countries are paying for vaccines. And so about um, a couple of years ago, I had the benefit of working with a student, Neve Hurley, a really bright student, and Raymond Hutubesi, who is a great collaborator at um, WHO. And as part of this work, what um, Neve did was actually to scour the literature. She did a really comprehensive job getting every single possible price in the public domain of an HPV vaccine, whether as part of a, uh, as, as part of sort of buying it on retail or as part of a big public tender, to ask, well, these vaccine prices are supposed to be tiered. That means countries that are richer are supposed to pay more for them. Countries that are poorer are supposed to pay less. If we take out the Gavi countries and the Paho countries where these, they pay one uniform price, in the rest of the world, this tier, if you were to regress the price that countries are paying for HPV vaccine against the actual income, the GDP per capita of these countries, this tier isn't really very tiered. The relationship is really very weak. 
and the slope of this relationship is really very shallow. And so they're really quite poor countries which are paying really high prices for this vaccine, a lot more than countries which are really quite rich are paying. Why is that? That's not very clear, but that really leads on to the question, well, can we do anything about this? And so I think part of maybe I would say the story of what I've been trying to do in the past few years is really to answer maybe two questions. One is I think there's a technical problem here. Well, are these countries really knowing how much they should pay for the vaccine, being able to negotiate good prices for the vaccine and knowing when or when they shouldn't introduce the vaccine? Sometimes they are getting very good prices. Are they actually buying the vaccine when they get the good price? Then second, there's a justice problem, I think. Is there something right or wrong in the way vaccines are made available or priced around the world? So let's talk about these two problems one at a time. First, the technical problem. So I talked about how we do this in the UK. I mean, uh, Yun and John and I go into a room in Public Health England and we work for uh, many nights putting code together. It runs on a suite of supercomputers um, these, um, with these um, extremely complex models. And eventually we get an answer, which I hope, I'd like to say it's a good answer. I mean, I have a vested interest in it being a good answer, so you'll have to ask someone else, but I, I think it was a nice model and gave, which gave a useful answer to base policy decisions on. Most countries that don't have HPV vaccine today really don't have the resources to do that. The computers, the um, facilities, the, the people who are able to do this, um, this, this, this kind of modeling and actually just even the data to parameterize the model. Actually, but the answer to the technical problem is actually you need to choose the right model. So this was some work um, together with WHO that we did, bringing actually most of the people involved in HPV modeling, especially in low and middle income countries around the world, really to ask the question, actually, if you want to evaluate the cost effectiveness of an HPV vaccine, what kind of model do you need to use? And the conclusion is that actually this vaccine is actually so good when it's given at the right time to people before the age of sexual debut that if actually you're looking at routine vaccination of girls prior to sexual debut, you don't need a very complicated model or a lot of data. If you're trying to answer very complex questions, like the questions we were asking in the UK, are still asking in the UK, should we vaccinate boys, should we vaccinate older, um, older females and so forth, then we do need these complex models. So, but actually, with a simple model can answer the question that most countries want to know, should I buy this vaccine at all and introduce it to nine-year-olds in my country? And so, um, together with Marc Brisson from Laval, um, sorry, Laval, not Laval, as a Portnoy who was at Hopkins at that time, and Raymond Hutubesi at WHO, we put together really what WHO really wanted us to do is they said, can you come up with a simple model, a simple interface that every country can use? They can put their own data in and they can see what price they should pay for this vaccine and whether it will be cost effective. So this was what we called PRIME, the Papillomavirus Rapid Interface for Modeling and Economics, because everyone needs an acronym for a model now because there's so many models. But basically the idea behind this was First of all, you could run this for every country in the world and get a quick answer. But more importantly, this is something that you can now download off the um, WHO website. Countries can download it and a few have and run it and see, OK, how, when is this vaccine cost effective to use? <clears throat> and since then, actually, the nice thing is to be able to have been able to collaborate with a bunch of other people and do the same for many other um, vaccines and actually then take this to countries, um, Vietnam, Mongolia, Armenia. Actually, Mongolia, Nisha is here. She was the person who led that work. Great to see you. And um, work with many other great people um, to actually, I mean, the mathematical computations behind all these papers are really quite simple. The, actually, the value for the countries is sitting down with them and actually saying, OK, put your data in here and uh, look at the answer. Does this answer make sense to you? If this answer makes sense, then what is the policy recommendation you're going to make? And often it is, yeah, we should buy this vaccine if the price is really this, this much. And so, um, so that's the technical problem, choosing the right model, making models available to countries so they can um, do this process on their own. Um, so that's the technical problem. But the second problem is actually what I'd say the justice problem. The justice problem is, I mean, we can look at Gavi countries, but in the rest of the world, 
are vaccine prices really priced in the right way? But then another part of that will say, well, what is driving the price? And who's to say what is a right or wrong, a good or bad price? And so here maybe I would sort of appeal to another moral philosopher, John Rawls, another famous chap, who is, I think, probably his, the most famous concept he came, up, he came up with was something called the veil of ignorance. Basically saying, if you were making decisions for, on behalf of a society, then actually how you should make them, the morally right way to make these decisions is to make them with a veil of ignorance, to imagine that you don't know who you are in that society. You could be anyone. And if that's the case, then you will definitely seek to benefit the worst off in that society because that could be you, right? And you wouldn't want to be in that worst off position. So, uh, um, so Rawls introduced this idea of the veil of ignorance. Now Rawls himself, he was quite reluctant to expand this beyond a single country. So for various reasons I won't go into. So he was quite reluctant to say, let's have a global veil of ignorance where, you don't even, where you're not even sure who you are in a society, you're not even sure which country you live in. But imagine we do expand this beyond the question of a single country to the globe, because now we're making global decisions, right? Imagine a global veil of ignorance. Imagine you do not know which country you live in. If you do not know which country you live in and you had the choice of what prices to price an HPV vaccine at, what prices would you choose to set for an HPV vaccine? <laughs> And just to be realistic, I'm not going to go as far as Rawls, who said that the, actually the ideal, if you put a veil of ignorance on people, then what you would do is what's called the maximin principle, which means that you would always seek to benefit the worst off first. I mean, even not going as far as that, because that has been, people have argued maybe that's good, that that's, um, might, might, might be um, going further than the veil of ignorance would suggest. But even then, there are a couple of things that maybe you'd say this is consistent with fairness. First of all, all countries should get net benefit from a vaccine, right? So you should not price a vaccine. Uh, essentially, the vac if the vaccine is to be used, countries should have a net benefit. The benefits they get from a vaccine should be greater than the cost. Second of all, to be realistic, vaccine manufacturers should have a positive net return on the investment. What they're saying is vaccine companies need to make money. That's the point they've always made, and it's true. If they don't make money, they're not going to make new vaccines. They're not going to fund research and development into new vaccines, right? Now, having said that, here's the somewhat more controversial, but I think consistent statement. Those countries or other actors like manufacturers that benefit more are able then to compensate those who are benefiting less from the vaccine. Those countries who benefit more can compensate those who benefit less and therefore, or are less able to pay and therefore make it affordable and beneficial for those countries that benefit less. So if you agree with these principles, then how do you operationalize this? Well, the work that we did um, together with Neve and Raymond was actually to take an, an economic idea called the, economic the idea of an economic surplus. So what's this idea? The idea is basically HPV vaccine is an innovation. So when you have an innovation, it creates value, right? It creates some um, value to the world. So let's take, for example, something we can all think about. Let's say a mobile phone. Or, I mean, I've got, I think I have a Samsung, but let's say you um, iPhone, first sort of like smartphone in the world. Let's say Apple builds an iPhone, right? iPhone creates value for the world because for the first time, people can check their Facebook accounts when they're on the <laughs> bus, right? Rather than having to wait till they go home. So that's worth something to a lot of people. So the value of, I know there are other good reasons to have an iPhone, not just to check face, your Facebook account. But anyway, uh, this value in, from this innovation of the iPhone, it can go to two groups of people. One is it can go to the producer. So Apple makes lots of money from selling iPhones because they charge more for the iPhone than it costs them to actually pay for its construction and pay for its development, right? So that's the producer surplus. Part of the value of the iPhone goes to Apple. And then part of it goes to the consumer. Obviously, people value the value of the iPhone to people who buy it is worth more than what they're paying for it. So the net, the difference between what they're paying for it and the value that they get from it is the consumer surplus. So instead of iPhones, think now of vaccines. Producer pays something to develop the vaccine, but they get revenues from vaccine sales. Lots of revenues in the case of HPV vaccine, the second most profitable vaccine in the world after PCV. 
That's the producer surplus. Consumers, they pay a certain amount for um, the, the vaccine and to deliver the vaccine, but they get economic benefits because people don't die or get cancer. How do we turn those economic benefits into a monetary value? Well, we use three different methods that have been proposed over the years. One from the Health Economics Group at York, one that WHO's Commission on Macroeconomic and Health suggested uh, more than a decade ago, although WHO has now emphasized that this is not meant to be a fixed rule. And one that, if you know the sort of um, the Grand Convergence paper, the Lancet Commission on Health suggested, whichever conversion factor you use, actually the answer is the same. I'm going to use the middle one to show these numbers, but the answer is basically the same. The if, you vac if, say, in a hypothetical world where you were to able to vaccinate 80% of the entire cohort of 12-year-old girls in the world, then the most value would accrue to the high income countries. And so basically what this is saying is if these countries can't afford the vaccines, these countries can actually afford to pay more for the vaccine so that these countries can pay less until the vaccine is affordable. Right. So that's the answer to the justice question. The, this vaccine can actually be priced a lot lower in some countries and still everyone would be happy. Still everyone would go home saying, you know, manufacturers would say, I've made my money. Countries would say, this is a good buy for me. And that's basically the um, paper that we wrote with a slightly provocative title, but I think one that was true. So that's the second story. First story about discounting. Second story about, well, what is the value of vaccines and how should we price vaccines? Both stories bringing together ideas of justice and mathematics and um, value together. The third story is really what about a situation where actually a more complex situation where you have a vaccine that benefits some people but actually harms some other people. And this is less of a sort of happy ending story, but this is the story of a vaccine against dengue that some you might have heard of. So when there are winners and losers. So a vaccine against dengue would be a great thing. And actually one was licensed a couple of years ago. So the company that developed this vaccine had trials both in Latin America and Southeast Asia where um, there's a lot of dengue. And actually, if you look at the trial results, there was something uh, somewhat disturbing about the results. So in people over the age of nine who got the vaccine, this vaccine worked. People who got the vaccine were less likely to have severe dengue after being vaccinated. So the, the relative risk of um, being hospitalized with dengue was lower in those vaccinated compared to those who weren't. In people who were less below nine years old, however, the relative risk was greater than one, which means actually people who got the vaccine were more likely to have severe dengue than the ones who didn't. So what does this mean? Well, basically, the manufacturer then sought a license only for people nine years and over and basically said, well, this vaccine should not be given to anyone below the age of nine, would might harm them. But, but for anyone over the age of nine, this is good. This is a vaccine that saves lives, prevents hospitalizations. Oh, but is that, very, is that really true? I mean, Scott Halstead and some other colleagues actually pointed out that age might be a proxy for zero status. What does that mean? That means it might be the case that older people are more likely to have had dengue in the past because you can have, can have, there are four different strains of dengue. So someone can have dengue up to four times in their lives. And maybe the people who are zero positive are the ones who actually benefit from the vaccine. The ones who are zero negative are the ones who are harmed by the vaccine. So this is some work that um, I did together with Stefan Flascher, um, who's here at the school, great colleague to work with, and also Neil Ferguson in, at Imperial College, where together we coordinated a consortium of modelers, basically um, with one uh, mechanism of action based on Scott Halstead's um, suggestion, in which basically this, um, the proposition was that maybe dengue acts like a silent infection. So the thing about dengue is that the second infection is, all, is the, usually the most severe. So people get dengue and then the second time they have dengue with a different strain, that creates some antibody enhancement, some immunological reaction that actually makes that episode of dengue really severe. And so maybe the vaccine really acts like an infection that is silent. That means people don't get sick, but then they skip one infection. And so if they've been vaccinated, if they've had an infection before, then this is great because then they can skip their second infection, which is not great. 
if they've never be, had an infection before, then if they get dengue, they get then get their they then get their secondary like infection, which is more severe, and so that's bad news. What does this actually mean if you put it together in a model? Well, it means that this vaccine becomes a better idea in countries with a high prevalence of dengue because when you vaccinate people, they're more likely to have had an infection before. And so when we brought this to WHO, um, there was some discussions over this and the conclusion was, well, this vaccine should only be used in settings with uh, where at least about 50 or 70 percent of people at the age of nine have already had been infected before are zero positive. <laughs> And so you can see that most of these dots are above um, the line, which means that overall in high prevalence settings, people will benefit from this vaccine. However, there's one important thing. The group of people who were seronegative, which is a minority of people, could still be harmed even in quite high seroprevalence settings. So here we have a bit of a moral dilemma. And actually, it's only afterwards I realized that this is some, what's known in sort of philosophical circles as the trolley problem. If, I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard of the trolley problem, but it's basically like this. You know, imagine you are sitting in the control office of a train track, right? And there is a train hurtling down the track. And actually, the person driving the train signals you and says, there's something's gone wrong with my brakes. What am I going to do? And to your horror, right in front of that train, the train's about to hit five people working on the track and they're going to die. But then you see, you are actually at the control and you see you can divert the train and send it along another track. And along that other track, there is actually, unfortunately, there's someone working on that track too. But it's only one person. And so you can divert the train from killing five people and it'll only kill one person. And so you'll save four lives. Or if you look at it differently, you'll kill one person, right? So that's the moral dilemma. Would you divert the train? And when you ask people this question, some people say, I will never divert the train as long as there's even one person on that track, no matter how many people I save, because killing someone through direct action is wrong, no matter how many people we save. Other people will say, well, it's not a one-to-one -one trade off, but if there are really five or 10 or 20 different people say different numbers on that track, and just one on the other, then I will divert the train because the trade off is worth it. But whoever you ask, they won't say the ratio is one-to-one -one because there is some uh, something about actually diverting the train and choosing to kill someone who has not chosen to be killed um, in, in this dilemma. Well, that was the dilemma for Dengvaxia. So the first, one of the first, I think, the first country in the world to introduce Dengvaxia was the Philippines. After the Philippines introduced it, the company that made this vaccine actually discovered that there was a new, there was a test which would allow them to go back to those people in the trial that they had vaccinated and work out whether they were actually seropositive or seronegative prior to being vaccinated. And so they got this test and to their credit, they went back and retested all these people and they discovered that actually Scott Halstead and others were right. The actual determinant of the, whether this vaccine helped or harmed people was not age, but seropositivity, seros which means that people who were not, who were not in fact, had never been infected by dengue and were given this vaccine were harmed by the vaccine. Now in the Philippines, this is a high prevalence setting. On average, this vaccine was almost certainly a good thing on average in the Philippines. More people benefited from the vaccine than were harmed. But there were a group of people who got this vaccine who were in hospital with dengue because of the vaccine, probably. And the, actually, the consequence of this, when, when this was announced, the government of the Philippines delisted the vaccine. It's no longer allowed to be sold in the Philippines. Not only that, but actually took the manufacturer and um, the lead researcher in the Philippines trial, in the Philippine trials to court with criminal charges. Now, this is an ongoing criminal case, so I'm not going to comment on whether I think these are the tr trial is appropriate or not. I'm simply saying this is a consequence of what happened. Uh, public confidence, not just in Dengvaxia, but in vaccines in general, decreased in the Philippines. I mean, this is somewhat horrifying news to hear when you've been sort of at the, in the middle of this doing the calculations and then, um, then the news comes and you find out actually a lot of the things that you put in the model was right in the end. But this suggests actually the fact that some, on average people in the Philippines were 
helped by this vaccine was not Im as important as the fact that there were some people who were harmed. A, a, a substantial minority of people were in the Philippines were harmed by this vaccine. Let me give you a more complicated example, which is less often thought of this way, but chicken pox vaccination, it's also a trolley problem, but a more complicated trolley problem. So this is modeling work that Albert Jan van Hoek, who used to be here at the school and at PHE, is now at, at RIBM together with John and some others did, actually looking at the impact of chicken pox or um, varicella vaccination. So this is an interesting vaccine because we vaccinate, well, people get chicken pox and then the virus stays in their um, nervous system after they recover. And as you probably know, they don't, no one gets chicken pox a second time, but it can reactivate as shingles, which is a pretty um, painful disease for a lot of people and on the whole more severe than chicken pox. So um, people who get chicken pox might later on have shingles later in life. Now there is a hypothesis for which there is quite a, there seems to be quite a bit of epidemiological evidence called the boosting hypothesis, which says that exposure to chicken pox again after you've had chicken pox the first time protects you from shingles because it basically gives the immune system a boost so that you're better protected against the chicken pox virus, the varicella zoster virus reactivating. And so if you introduce a chicken pox vaccine, what happens? Well, the modeling predicts the incidence of chicken pox will decrease. All these people who got the vaccine, they're protected against chicken pox. But actually, the incidence of shingles will increase in the medium term because their parents their, or the older generations are no longer encountering children with chicken pox and having their immune system boosted. And so for a period of time, you're worse off because you have the more severe disease instead of the less severe disease. But in the long run, actually, all these people will be dead and there'll be a new generation who has never had chicken pox before, right? <laughs> so this is often presented as a time, as a time preference problem. Are you gonna, wh how long is your time horizon? Do you only think about 30 years or do you, can you put your time horizon at 100 years and think in 100 years time, this will be great? But actually, maybe it's not really a time preference problem. Maybe it's really a trolley problem because the real question is, are we, willing to harm some people in this generation to benefit some people in this generation. But the question is really, where is the train going? One way to say is that we're actively choosing to, um, we're, we're actually choosing to divert the train to harm these older people in order to save these younger people. Another way to do it is saying, actually, no, the trolley's in the other direction. What we're really saying is, are we willing to let children suffer from chicken pox so they can protect their ad the adults, right? So the causality here is really not very clear. But just to end this, this is some work really led by Albert Jan and Jeroen Leuten at the uh, Catholic University of Leuven, together with Katie Atkins here and um, some others and myself, really asking people, well, who do you prefer to benefit or disbenefit? Who would you, um, if you could give a vaccine, which had certain effects on children, certain effects on adults, certain effects on um, certain indirect effects because you can protect people through herd immunity or certain side effects, who would you prefer to benefit or, uh, at the cost of harming other people? And the results we got from this is really to say that actually, we most, um, on average, people prefer to give protection, whether directly or indirectly through herd effects, through more vulnerable people, like children that, who are too young to get vaccinated, for instance. Um, so those are the people, uh, or, or for instance, people who are too old to have a strong immune response. That's the, that's, that's the idea behind what we think people are thinking, compared to sort of middle-aged adults. So the, 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 the conclusion from this is actually not everything is equal. Side effects are valued more severely than direct effects. Um, vaccine benefits to certain groups of people are, ben um, are valued more highly than benefits to other groups of people. So I'm going to just end by making some propositions, some conclusions, and then a final slide just to thank a few people. First of all, I'd like, this is a suggestion since I'm allowed to more or less say anything I like for an inaugural lecture, I hope. <laughs> but it's really that, you know, economic models are not value-free mathematical contrivances. Economists know this and modelers know this. But in really, these models are informed by, and in turn, they inform wider narratives about justice, about rightness, about um, values and goodness. 
And I think we, as the modeling economic epidemiological community, we have an obligation to investigate this, to communicate this, and to debate the normative values behind our work as they interact with our data and computations. We do, we make, we spend a lot of time making sure that the data and the computations are correct. And we ought to, these are really important things. We ought to be making sure these are right, but we should be Make, make, um, taking the um, effort to actually investigate and communicate and explore the actually the values that underlie these um, as assumptions and calculations in the models too. So thank you. I think that's all. I'd just like to end by really saying um, all this work is not really a journey I've taken myself. I've talked about a lot of people and rather than end with a long list of people that I'd like to thank, I thought I'd show you their photos because they're also really good looking people and <laughs> where, where they are on the globe. So I, I mean, I really want to thank people here at the school and at PHE whom I've worked with over the years and the team uh, around us now. I think these are, you, you've really been an incredible bunch of people to work with. I couldn't have asked for better and this is a great place to work. And I think also I'd like to acknowledge actually John Edmonds who's been well, I would say my mentor and inspiration for the last 10 years, even though he's far too down to earth to use words like that to describe himself. Um, I, I, actually, other people I'd like to acknowledge is um, collaborators around the world who have been part of this journey as well. And I deliberately want to show them on a map because I really feel that we can go further and discover more when we work across these um, national boundaries. And one of the greatest things about working here at the London School is this is a school that believes in that, even at a time when it's not so straightforward to say it anymore. And I'm really glad for that. I'm really glad to be part of this. I mean, I'd like to... I'd, I'd like to acknowledge those colleagues at WHO. I mean, some of them said they'll be watching me on the live stream. So if you're there, shout out to you, you people at WHO. You know that, um, you know that I'm a big fan and supporter of your work. So um, thank you also, um, Raymond and Tanya and the rest of you, if you're watching this. And really, I'd like to also thank the people who came, and especially my mom who came all the way from Malaysia and, um, well, other friends, some of whom came from a long way away as well. So thank you very much and thank you for listening. Thank you, Mark. That's fantastic. So it's, um, it's my job. Uh, to say something nice about Mark for a few minutes, <laughs> and then uh, and then invite you down for uh, to drink some wine and celebrate. So um, uh, I'm going to try and do that, and I won't not, won't take too much of your time. But um, it's very easy to say something nice about Mark. Um, well, you've seen the quality of his work. He's a fantastic academic, and he's also uh, you, you maybe he's a little bit shy, but he's an, he's a superb. He's such a nice human being. He's such a uh, a friendly, nice person. So I'm going to say a couple of words um, just to say how I've known Mark over the years. I've known Mark since our time at the, uh, at, at the HPA in the Modelling and Economics Unit. So um, this is Mark uh, looking about 12, but then <laughs> <laughs> he still looks about 12 now. So, um, but, and I remember, I remember distinctly when we, when we employed him, at, at, this was now about, I think about 15 years ago, is it Mark? Something like that in um, some, some uh, around that, um, and uh, and uh, Liz Miller, who's my mentor, really. I don't know if Liz is here, but um, uh, a wonderful person. And so Liz and, and I uh, interviewed Mark, and we asked him to give a, uh, all the interviewees uh, asked them to give us a small talk, you know, a five-minute presentation. And uh, me and Liz didn't have a clue what Mark was talking about. <laughs> and at the end of it, uh, we thought, uh, you know, we had this quite long discussion about, oh, you know. Uh, you know, because Liz was like, because oh, we wanted someone who with a uh, uh, strong on economics, and Liz was like, I'm not quite sure he's really got the economics background. He's certainly got the mathematical ones, but we were completely lost with what he was talking about. But um, and then, and I, and I remember saying to Liz and sort of persuading him, saying, I think we'll take the risk. You know, that's the probably the the, the best best uh, risk I've ever taken. It was uh, it's really paid off over the years. So not only within within a matter of um, a few months really uh, so we threw Mark into the deep end there was this huge decision that was being made about HPV vaccination in the UK um, and we decided that we were going to take on you know we, we 
provide much of the information to JCVI, which is the body that makes this, these sorts of decisions. So we provide much of the modelling, and, or all of the modelling in economics, and certainly did those in those days. And, um, and Mark was really responsible for doing that. And I have never known anybody to work as hard as that for as long as that. So within 18 months or so of doing this, Mark had published about four papers, and um, including this one in the BMJ, which really set uh, put everything together. Um, it was an uh, absolutely heroic effort to, to do all of this, and involving Mark sleeping overnight. <laughs> he was saying that the computers were working hard, but it wasn't, they weren't the only ones just working hard. So Mark, I remember uh, sleeping overnight, and in the, in the, we'd come in in the morning, and he was still there. <laughs> oh my God, Mark, you should have gone home. And, um, uh, but yeah, it was an amazing effort, and uh, and he really hasn't stopped. Uh, he's been um, he's been uh, producing high quality, really high quality research um, at the same kind of rate ever for you know ever since then. And in fact, when I when I left the HPA um, and I came to the school, which is a, another good decision I made, but um, but uh, I, I thought, well, I, I really didn't want to. Um, I didn't want to rip out the heart of the of the research my old research group at the HBA. I'd spent a long time building it up. I was proud of it. I was proud of what the research group did. I didn't want to just sort of cherry pick pick people and and bring them to the school. And I kept like that for a year or two. And then I really really couldn't resist offering Mark a post here at the <laughs> here at, uh, at 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 the school. So and that was the start of Mark then gradually moving more and more of his time to to the school. And uh, something I'm very happy about. So, um, and you know, this is just, I, I quickly Googled him, I put him onto PubMed this, the, in this afternoon, and I, just to look at some of the papers, you know, he publishes 20 odd papers a year on average, and I was just looked at the sort of papers that he published, you know, you know, this is, this is the top, this, uh, this isn't a selection, this is just the top list, you know, there's one in Lancet, infectious disease there, well, health technology assessment, everybody's got to do that every now and then. Uh, social science and medicine, Lancet Global Health. You know, this is Nature, uh, Ecology, and Evolution. Lancet Global Health. This is just the you know the the last few papers that Mark has published. You know, and so uh, you know he really is a sort of head of department's dream. Not only is he sort of publishing huge quantities of high quality work, high impact work, but his teaching is uh, fantastic. I mean, his, uh, the, re the reviews he gets from students are uh, unbelievable. Um, he takes the time, he, he talks to people, he infuses people. You could see it from the talk that, that, that he gave today. He thinks about it. He's a proper scholar, a proper academic. You know, he's, again, you could see that from his, uh, from his talk today. So he, he really has been a, a fantastic colleague. And, 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 and as he mentioned with his last slide, he is so collaborative that his network of people that he works with around the world is, is really incredible. So on top of that, I asked, of course, people to send me some slides of, uh, of uh, some pictures of Mark, and I promised him I, I wouldn't get, I wouldn't ask any of his family for for, for old pictures. Uh, anyway, you don't need to. He, he's going to look exactly the same, and you know, <laughs> uh, you know so he'd just be wearing shorts. So, I mean, there wouldn't be any difference. So, um, but I did, I did. A couple of colleagues did send me some pictures uh, in just to sort of show Mark in, diff in a different light. So this is one, for instance. So Mark, you can get Mark to come out and, and, and have fun in the evening. So that, uh, <laughs> you know, and this is Mark, although he doesn't drink. And uh, this is Mark, again, from the HPA days. Mark, Mark looking considerably less drunk than the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, he's good fun to have a, on, on, a, on a night out. And, you know, you need someone to find you a taxi as well. But um, and when, when I asked for some pictures of Mark, then many of them came, fall, fell into this category of you know meetings because Mark of course spends an awful lot of his time at international meetings. He is an you know important international uh, scholar, and he, you know he does a huge amount of work for WHO and Gavi and these other international bodies. And so uh, uh, many of the paper uh, of the pictures that people sent me were fell into this category, and they fell into the category of you know standing there in a rather formal meeting you know with some formal clothes on and stuff. But they also fell into the category of Mark hiding, you know, <laughs> which sort of says something about Mark, you know, he's quite shy and he doesn't want to put himself, you know, in the foreground, quite literally. Um, so, uh, so I thought I'd play a game with one or two of them. So th there's, a, there's an easy one. It's a sort of, you know, where's Wally again? There's an easy <laughs> one. There's Mark. So here's another one. Anybody know where Mark is there? <laughs> yep, there he is. <laughs> what about this one? 
Any idea where Mark is? <laughs> yep, there he is. And in fact, they took two photos with this one, which made me... Uh, which they, they got people to wave. Where's Mark? There he is. <laughs> there's, there's Mark. Um, you know, at whatever meeting this, this one was. So... Um, so this was sort of uh, this. Th this was uh, typical of the sort of pictures and uh, things that that people sent me, and then I thought I'd finish with some words that uh, one of Mark's great collaborators, Raymond Tutabesi uh, at WHO, who is in this picture, but it's more, more obvious here he is, um, uh, sent me. So uh, when Raymond found out that uh, Mark was given this inaugural, he couldn't be here; he's on holiday with his family. But he did send me some words, and I thought I would just just uh, just. Uh, show this to you because I, I think this does summarise. Since we were, we were introduced to each other more than a decade ago, I've been very much enjoying working with you. First is a great rapporteur for IVRAC, that's one of the WHO committees that Raymond is the secretariat for, and since 2014 as one of the most devoted members of the committee. On behalf of WHO, I'd like to thank you for all your excellent contributions to infectious disease modelling, economics and public health in general. You have helped us with shaping the committee as it is now, but above all, I appreciate your friendship, generosity, and kindness. Congratulations for your full professorship. And I think that really does sum it up. The amount of work that Mark has put in, his, 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 the respect that people have for him across the world, um, uh, you know, in these, these diverse fields of modeling, economics, and public health, and, and just the, 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 his, his friendship, his openness, and kindness. It really sh shines through uh, in, in the sort of collaborations and the appreciation that many of us have for Mark, so thank you, Mark. And I'd finish with this last picture with Mark looking as professorial as possible. <laughs> but at least he's wearing a tie anyway, so that's, that's one for his mum. Thank you, Mark. And it's downstairs for nibbles and drinks.